Mary Ann Cotton was born on 31 October 1832 in the village of Low Mersley, County Durham in northern England. She was the first English-known female serial killer who was responsible for the murders of up to 21 people. Mary Ann Cotton was only charged with one murder, her stepson Charles Edward Cotton but is thought to have killed three husbands, up to ten of her own children, stepchildren, her mother, a lover, and a friend who got in her way. She was executed by way of hanging in Durham Prison on March 24, 1873. Her method of killing her victims was by poison using arsenic, her reasons were to collect the life insurance money. Her father was a minor who died when she was eight, and Mary and her brother were raised by their mother, who was impoverished after the loss of her husband. Mary's mother later remarried, and Mary is said to have loathed her stepfather. Conflicts with the stepfather led her to flee the family home when she was just 16 to work as a servant in a prosperous household in South Hedden. The quality of Mary Ann's work caused no complaint, although she began what would become a life riddled with sexual scandals. Soon after Mary Ann began working in the household, the South Hedden gossips were busy spreading tales about illicit meetings between Mary Ann and a local churchman. She then left her role as servant and she married for the first time to a man named William Mowbray in 1852, aged 20, and had five children, four of whom died in infancy, a high rate of infant mortality even in the Victorian era, although they were probably viewed as unlucky parents at this moment in time. None of these deaths are registered, as although registration was compulsory at the time, the law was not enforced until 1874. The only birth recorded was that of their daughter Margaret Jane, born at St. Germans in 1856. William and Mary Ann moved back to North East England, where William worked as a foreman aboard a steam vessel sailing out of Sunderland. Another daughter, Isabella, was born in 1858, and Margaret Jane died in 1860. Another daughter, also named Margaret Jane, was born in 1861, and a son, John Robert William was born in 1863 but died late the next year from gastric fever. William and Mary often argued over money as Mary Ann was obsessed with not becoming poor and in January 1865, he returned from time away from work to nurse an injured foot. Mary helped with his recovery and he subsequently died of a sudden intestinal disorder no more than a month later. The lives of William and of their children were insured by the British and Prudential Insurance Office and Mary Ann collected a payout of £35 on William's death, equivalent to £3,421 in 2020, about half a year's wages for a manual labourer at the time, and she received £2.5 shillings for John Robert William. The doctor who cared for William during this time had come back to visit a short time after to console the grieving widow but was surprised to find Mary Ann dancing around the room in a new dress she had purchased with the money from the life insurance. Now a widow, Mary Ann moved to Seaham Harbour, County Durham to start a new life. It was in County Durham where she struck up a relationship with Joseph Natras, a local man who was engaged to another woman. During this time, her three-and-a-half-year-old daughter, the second Margaret Jane, died of typhus fever, leaving her with one child of up to nine she had born. She returned to Sunderland and took up employment at the Sunderland Infirmary, House of Recovery for the Cure of Contagious Fever, Dispensary, and Humane Society where she would have been able to obtain more arsenic. She sent her surviving child, Isabella, to live with her mother. At the Sunderland Infirmary, Mary Ann kept the wards clean with a mixture of soap and arsenic, and the infirmary staff admired her diligence and friendliness with the patients. She chatted with many of them, but one in particular, engineer George Ward, took a fancy to Mary Ann. Soon after he was discharged from the infirmary, he and Mary Ann were married at a church in Munqueermouth in August of 1865. Although now settled into a new marriage and a steady household, Mary Ann did not go and get Isabella back from her mother's house. Despite having been released from the infirmary, George Ward developed health problems soon after marrying Mary Ann and despite various treatments by his doctors, he died in October of 1866. 
The cause of death recorded on his death certificate is that of English cholera and typhoid. The doctor attending George was accused of incorrectly treating his patient, a point of view that Mary Ann actively encouraged, hoping to redirect any doubts away from herself, and succeeded. Once again, Mary Ann collected insurance money following George's death. Much later, at Mary Ann's trial, people would wonder why nobody became suspicious of this woman who left a trail of husbands and children dead from startlingly similar illnesses over a very short time. But as Mary Ann had different doctors attend to her dying family and she relocated frequently, suspicions never built in a single community. Following her normal pattern, after Ward's death in Sunderland, Mary Ann needed to move on. Pallion shipwright James Robinson needed a housekeeper to care for his house and his children after his wife Hannah had passed away. In November of 1866, Mary Ann applied for the housekeeping position and was hired. Two days before Christmas, the youngest child of the family had developed, surprisingly, gastric fever. Overcome with the pain of the recent deaths of his wife and then of his infant son, James turned to Mary Ann for comfort and support. She was more than happy to provide this and apparently more than comfort, as she was soon pregnant with Robinson's child. A new marriage seemed to be on the horizon, but three months later, Mary Ann was diverted in March of 1867, her mother had suddenly become ill with hepatitis. Mary Ann returned to the home of her mother to help nurse the elderly lady back to health. As always, one of Mary Ann's first tasks was to clean the house from top to bottom with soap and her favorite cleaning additive arsenic, of which she always had a supply of. By the time Mary Ann arrived, however, her mother was doing much better and seemingly on the mend but Mary Ann decided to stay and look after her anyway, as well as visit her own daughter Isabella, who was still living with her grandmother. Mary Ann's mother died at the age of 54 in the spring of 1867, nine days after Mary Ann's arrival. Also in 1867, Mary Ann's stepfather George Stott married his widowed neighbor, Hannah Paley. Returning to the Robinson household with Mary Ann, Young Isabella had been enjoying a life of good health while living away from Mary Ann. But to no surprise, she soon developed severe stomach pains and died, as did two of Robinson's children, Elizabeth and James. All three children were buried in the last week of April and the first week of May 1867. Mary Ann received a life insurance payment of five pounds ten shillings and six pennies for Isabella. Robinson married Mary Ann at St. Michael's. Bishop Wearmouth on August 11, 1867. Their first child Margaret Isabella was born that November, but she became ill and died in February 1868. Their second child George was born on June 18, 1869. Robinson, meanwhile, had become suspicious of his wife's insistence that he insure his life, he discovered that she had run up debts of sixty pounds behind his back and had stolen more than fifty pounds that she had been expected to bank. Then he found that Mary Ann had been forcing his older children to pawn household valuables. He then threw her out to the streets, retaining custody of their son George. In late 1869, after wandering the streets and living the kind of life that Mary Ann had always anxiously feared, Mary Ann and her daughter visited an acquaintance of hers. During the course of the visit, Mary Ann asked her friend to watch her daughter while she went out to mail a letter. Mary Ann never came back and the daughter was returned to James on the first day of 1870. After weeks of desperate living, the year 1870 began well for Mary Ann. Her friend Margaret Cotton introduced her to her brother Frederick. Like James Robinson, Frederick was also a recent widower, unfortunately losing two of his four children to early deaths. His sister acted as mother's substitute for the family, although in late March she died from an undetermined stomach ailment which left Mary Ann to comfort the grieving Frederick, and just like her previous relationship with James Robinson, she was soon pregnant with Frederick's child which was her twelfth pregnancy. Cotton and Mary Ann were bigamously married on September 17, 1870 at St. Andrews, Newcastle-upon-Tyne, and their son Robert was born early in 1871. Soon after, Mary Ann learned that her former lover, Joseph Natras, was living 48 kilometers away in the County Durham village of West Auckland, and was no longer married. 
she rekindled the romance and persuaded her new family to move near him. In December of 1871, Frederick died of gastric fever and Joseph Natras soon became Mary Ann's lodger. To keep money coming in, Mary Ann worked as a nurse to John Quick Manning, an excise officer recovering from smallpox. Mary Ann apparently saw Quick Manning as a better match than Natras, and soon became pregnant by him with her thirteenth and final child. She wanted to get married to Quick Manning but the attempts were hindered by the presence of the remaining Cotton household, so Mary Ann apparently went to work quickly and Frederick Jr. died in March of 1872 and the infant Robert soon after. Upon the death of her infant, Mary Ann stated that she did not want to bury the baby immediately, because Joseph Natras had also become ill with gastric fever, and she would wait and handle both burials at once to save money. Natras passed away soon after Robert, but not before revising his will to leave everything to Mary Ann. Only one of her husbands, James Robinson, had managed to evade a painful death at the hands of Mary Ann. Other husbands, children, and most stepchildren had succumbed to gastric fever or stomach ailments, except for young Charles Cotton and Robinson's children. The Robinson children were safely away from Mary Ann. But the insurance policy Mary Ann had taken out on Charles's life still waited to be collected. In the late spring of 1872, Mary Ann sent Charles to a local chemist to purchase some arsenic. The chemist refused to sell the poison to anyone under the age of 21, as was this was the law. Mary Ann then asked a neighbor to purchase the substance and in July of the same year, Charles died of gastric fever. But Mary Ann had either been in the West Auckland area too long, or the neighbors were more readily skeptical because suspicions were immediately aroused in neighbors and physicians. The first person Mary Ann told about Charles's death was Thomas Riley, a minor government official that she had been in contact with regards sending Charles into a workhouse. Riley had said that it would only be possible if she went with him, which she declined. She told Riley that the boy was in the way of marriage with Quick Manning and predicted that, I won't be troubled long. He'll go like all the rest of the Cotton family. Riley said the boy appeared completely healthy, and so he was surprised when Mary Ann stopped him only five days later to say that young Charles had died. Riley went to the police and to a doctor to outline his suspicions. The doctor was surprised to hear of the news as he and his assistant had tended to Charles five times during the previous week and had detected nothing life-threatening in the young boy. Riley convinced the doctor to delay writing a death certificate until he could look into the situation further. The first thing Mary Ann did was go to the insurance office to collect on Charles's policy. She learned that they would not issue the money until they had a death certificate, so she returned home to get the document from the doctor. Instead of receiving the certificate, Mary Ann was told that she would not be receiving a signed death certificate until after a formal inquest was held. Angry at Riley for initiating the investigation, Mary Ann told him that he would be responsible for the costs of Charles's burial. Mary Ann tried to hurry along with the marriage to Quick Manning but the local newspapers latched onto the story. Quick Manning was appalled by this type of gossip about his wife-to-be and was apparently distressed enough to sever all connections with Mary Ann. Mary Ann started to make plans to leave the area, although her friends warned her that it would look suspicious if she did. Unknown to her, however, suspicions were already building and were about to close in around her. A doctor from the inquiry had kept samples of Charles's stomach so that he could test them later in his lab. Of course, the samples tested positive for arsenic. The doctor went to the authorities, who arrested Mary Ann and ordered Charles's body exhumed and fully tested. The body of Joseph Natras was also dug up after six exhumations of other corpses. The elderly sexton of the church couldn't remember exactly where Natras was buried and subsequently tested positive for the presence of arsenic. There was debate and talk of further exhumations, but it was decided to proceed with the single murder charge of young Charles Cotton, although the trial was delayed until after the delivery of the daughter fathered by John Quick Manning. Her trial began in March of 1873. The prosecution brought forth numerous witnesses who testified about Mary Ann's purchases of arsenic, the long list of gastric fever victims in her past and about her statements to Riley regarding Charles being an obstacle to her marrying Quick Manning. 
The defense claimed that Charles may have obtained the arsenic that killed him from inhaling loose airborne particles of arsenic that was used as a dye in the green wallpaper of the cotton home. The judge dismissed this theory and the jury retired for only 90 minutes before finding Mary Ann guilty of the murder of Charles Cotton. Mary Ann continued to proclaim her innocence and wrote numerous letters to her friends and supporters. A letter to her only surviving husband, James Robinson. She asked him to bring her child to visit her in prison. She went on to blame Robinson saying everything bad happening to her was due to him kicking her out to the streets. Mary Ann has tried to get a petition circulated in her support. Petitions were eventually created and signed by her former employers, ministers, and other supporters. As her execution date neared, she was cheered by a letter from the couple who had adopted the infant she and Quick Manning had conceived. She replied to the letter, asking the couple to kiss my babe for me. On March 24, 1873, Mary Ann was led to the scaffold where the hangman misjudged the logistics of the execution, leaving the rope too short so instead of dying quickly, Mary Ann struggled to death instead of snapping her neck after the trapdoor was released, and it took at least three minutes for her to be slowly and painfully strangled by the noose. Chances are, some of Mary Ann's alleged victims died from natural causes or reasons other than poisoning by her hands. Later researchers of the case would estimate her victims as numbering anywhere from 15 to the full count of 21 people who died while living with or near Mary Ann, 10 of her children by various husbands, 3 of those husbands, 5 stepchildren, her mother, Cotton's sister Margaret, and her lover Natras. Theories of motive range from the collection of insurance money to the desire to rid herself of people that she felt were obstacles or potentially a combination of both. Because she maintained her innocence to the end, it will never be known for sure how many victims Mary Ann claimed in her endless quest for the money that made her feel secure. Her notoriety continues with her fame as Britain's first female serial killer and in an old popular children's rhyme, here are the lyrics. Mary Ann Cotton dead and forgotten. She lies in her bed. With her eyes wide open. Sing, sing, oh, what can I sing? Mary Ann Cotton is tied up with string. Where, where? Up in the air. Selling black puddings a penny a pair. Thank you and goodbye.